Good afternoon, and welcome to the March 2019 Ask Me Anything Manufacturing webinar. My name is Heather Brose, and I'll be your moderator today. I lead the marketing at SME for the Canadian Manufacturing Technology Show, and that'll take place September 30th through October 3rd, 2019, at the International Centre in Toronto. Today's AMA MFG topic is your intelligent connected factory getting started. And our technical expert is Avner ben Basat, President and CEO of Platane Technologies. Before we get started with the Q&A, I'd like to go through some basic housekeeping items. And this will just help you get the most out of your session today. Um, just a few things. Uh, the session is being recorded. We will have it available after um, after the uh, webinar is over, probably in a couple of days, we'll have a link available on the website, the same place that you registered, and you can um, view that recording. We'll also email this out to everyone who registered in advance um, so that you'll have it um, to uh, go back to and reference. Um, we do have some questions that were submitted in advance, but we will be accepting questions throughout the session. So go ahead and type those in your chat window. We will get to those throughout the session today. Uh, we will be moderating questions um, just to make sure they're a good fit for uh, and match the topic that we're talking about. And we may end up having uh, priority placed for questions that are being asked by multiple participants. Um, we're going to uh, accept questions until about 12.50 today. Um, just so that we have enough time to answer those last few questions before we finish up uh, at about 1 o'clock. At the end of the session, um, we will have a survey that will pop up for you. We ask that you please just take a minute and complete that uh, survey and give us some feedback. I think there's only three questions, so it's very quick and easy, but that will help us in planning uh, future events um, for the series. If you have suggestions for upcoming webinars and topics, um, please go ahead and send us an email at amamfg at sme.org. We will um, be holding multiple uh, webinars between now um, and CMTS. Um, so we're looking for suggestions on things you want to hear about, questions you have that you want to get answered, um, and we'll have more to come um, in the next uh, coming months. We also will be holding the AMA MFG series at CMTS, so there will be some live sessions at the event. We will have more details for you as we finalize some of them, um, but uh, CMTS will be coming up this fall, so keep an eye out on CMTSXCA for updated information. And now I'd like to introduce you to Abner Bendasat, who's our technical expert for today's session. Avner is the president and CEO of Platane, a leading provider of industrial IoT and AI-based optimization solutions for complex manufacturing environments. Avner leads Platane's product vision and global business strategy. Platane solutions are used by leading manufacturers worldwide, including Airbus, GE, General Atomics, and Steelcase. And Avner, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, great to have you here today. Thanks for joining us and uh, helping us answer questions about getting started with an intelligent connected factory. Uh, thanks a lot, Heather, and thank you, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Um, allow me a minute here to share a brief presentation, and we'll get started. Uh, so again, uh, hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm the CEO of Platane. We're a software company and we specialize in um, IoT and AI-based solutions, artificial intelligence. Uh, we work a lot with, uh, you know, with SME in various uh, capacities and, and uh, opportunities. And you know, today in discussion with Heather and the SME team, we really wanted to address very practical questions. Uh, you know, a lot's been said about these uh, technologies. Uh, there's a, you know, a lot of buzzwords floating around. So you know, my goal, our goal today is to really bring it down to earth um, eventually 
It's a technology and it affects very physical things, our manufacturing environment. So I wanted to share some, some thoughts, uh, opportunities, challenges, best practices, you know, however I can uh, best address and answer your questions. Uh, I want to start with some context and some background here. Um, because, you know, whatever we call it, Industry 4.0 or IoT and whatnot, um, it's, it's happening and it's driving tremendous value. Uh, this is a research done by the McKinsey Consulting Company, actually one of our partners, and we're seeing this, this impact, not just in, in bottom line savings, uh, you know, reduction of scrap, uh, improvements of energy efficiency, et cetera, but also and probably a lot more interesting in the top line impact improve productivity, improve throughput, capacity, better quality, and the like. So this research, uh, we can share the link later, it's, it's public, really went out globally and identified those companies that did implement this and, and really tried to capture what they saw from it. Uh, these are big OEMs, but also very small suppliers, and, and similar results, albeit with a range, are observed in multiple industry verticals, uh, geographies, and company size. You know, the, the other thing they try to identify is the uh, relative advantage of a company that is quick to adopt this technology and compared to those that are not. And different technologies would get a different rating on this question, but again, the specific adoption of AI is actually creating huge benefit uh, for those that start with it early. Not to say that it's easy, uh, but uh, getting a kind of a front runner advantage uh, creates opportunity and creates advantage. And certainly we can discuss this today. Probably a key question is, you know, where do we even start? But again, this is seen uh, globally and across multiple verticals and company sizes. Specifically, our experience, uh, just to give some context, is, is with a broad range of, of companies, manufacturing companies, multiple segments from aerospace to, you know, turbine manufacturing, furniture, automotive, et cetera, but also working with a, with a very, you know, uh, good set of partners to suggest that there's an ecosystem here. Uh, we are certainly not alone, and this is at the top of the minds of, of key players in the industry, whether these are consulting firms or system integrators, uh, other software vendors such as SAP and uh, Siemens, and even Google, which we know more from the uh, consumer world, is also making strides into the manufacturing world. Um, so a lot more focus on that, uh, not just from vendors, but actually from actual manufacturing organizations. Now, why is this all happening? And, and I did want to share this uh, problem statement with everybody. Uh, before we get started and, and open it up to questions. What we're seeing a lot is that the manufacturing challenge has become so much more complex than it was 10, 20, or, or 50 years ago. Uh, much higher volumes, much greater production complexity, uh, customization needs, engineering challenges, and the like. And, you know, the natural expectation is for economies of scale. You want that, your customers are expecting that, etc. What's really happening is this red line, and you see here some testimonials that we've collected over time, and while the expectation was for improved economics, what they're really seeing is, is the opposite. And it's not just deteriorating, it's at some point collapsing. And what we're seeing is that the current systems that are in place um, are just not able to cope as expected with these challenges. Multiple systems, very poor connectivity, uh, a vast amount of Excel spreadsheets, human touch points, and the like. So while this all worked when things were simple, it simply doesn't work anymore, creating, in a nutshell, uh, excess costs or reduced rates or, or lack of, of ability to compete. So again, this is, this is our experience, and, and happy to discuss this more today, but the solution in this case is not only in the technology, but in the correct um, application or deployment of the technology, really maturing the systems and processes to a point where they are able to, scope, to cope with today's complexity. A word about us, uh, today we offer a set of solutions that they're well-defined uh, and address very specific problems. 
Not, no need to go into them specifically. The main point here is that when we talk about these technologies, it's very important to ask, what is it good for? What does it do? So in this discussion today, when we transcend from the buzzword level to the production floor, I will again and again you know, ask and say, what are we trying to do? What problem are we trying to solve? And then everything becomes a lot easier to discuss. Uh, whether these are the problems you're looking at now or others, but it's all about the business problem or manufacturing problem and the eventual value proposition. I mentioned the impact and, and it's there, whether it's digitization, a bottom line impact or top line impact. And I think this is what eventually we all want to achieve. Um, during the session today, uh, certainly happy to take questions on this topic as well. Uh, not only how you capture these, but how you document these in order to get the, the management buy-in and the like. So really turning it over to you guys, um, you know, we, we've received some of the questions in advance. Um, a lot of them are discussing, you know, how do we harness these technologies? You know, what exactly are all these buzzwords and, and tech terms? You know, how do I start or, or where should I start? Uh, what about impact and ROI? And some questions we got also discussed, you know, employee training, uh, buy-in, and so forth. So, um, again, perhaps, Heather, turning to you, if you want to start uh, bringing up any of the questions and or coming from the audience today. Sure. Thanks for that intro. I think that sets a, a nice stage for uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first question I want to uh, ask you is, what are some of the basic questions um, to ask and the key points to look for uh, when manufacturers are looking to move toward a connected factory? Okay, thank you. Well, the first question is, is why, okay? Too many times we are getting this feedback and, you know, well, why, are you wanting, why do you want to do this? Well, because my boss told me to or there's a board directive to do something about IoT. And, uh, you know, frankly speaking, it's not a good answer. So my question is, you know, what are you trying to improve on your production floor? Do you have a, an issue with your throughput? Are there quality challenges that you want to solve? Are we talking about uh, machine or tool downtime, uh, material waste? Any of these classic, truly classic manufacturing KPIs that a good organization would measure and then want to improve. So when, when, when manufacturers, you know, talk about a connected factory, that is the means to an end, that is not the end. And my first question is, okay, you know, we'll do something, but what is it that you need? And then the discussion becomes much more concrete and, and much more viable uh, for the future of a project. So that's good. So that kind of leads us into the next um, the next question, where you you now you've you've got some basic questions to ask, and but then then what do you do? How do you really start? And what are the the first steps of moving forward? Okay, sure. So um, you define the problem, what you're trying to improve or fix, and then you know you want to define a solution. In this case today, we're talking about a new technology, be it a software or hardware technology, that um, solves that solution. Uh, if we're talking about software that improves throughput, then this software needs data, which I think this is what this uh, question is leading to. So yes, we need to collect data, and the data in, in today's you know connected factory uh, world typically comes from from three um, areas. Um, one is, you know, other machines, uh, sorry, machines or sensor. So when we talk about IoT data, we're typically referring to, um, let me share a quick slide here. Um, we're talking about data that comes from sensors or machines. These machines or sensors create vast amount of data, which is an excellent an op opportunity. Um, the other source of data is the systems that you currently have. Uh, your ERP, your MES, uh, your CAD systems have a ton of data 
that is often underutilized. And we want to utilize that. And the third is, are the users, your, uh, your staff, your operators, your supervisors, they are an excellent source of data. Uh, typically, they are very knowledgeable, uh, and then they can supplement the picture as well. So the key here is to collect the data, but the emphasis is to collect the data that is relevant. You know, not having um, the data that is not. And this is a very critical point because um, if we have a specific problem we want to solve, then that specific problem has a very specific solution. And that specific solution has very specific data that it needs. And that's all we want to get. Um, so this is where you start. Now, um, too much data often puts this project in this long swamp of, of data integration and collection challenges, which are really uh, very ineffective, but also in many cases lead to the death of the project. So the specificity here is critical. Now, eventually, um, we can talk also about piloting the system and the like, but um, define the problem, collect the data, and put the technology to work. These are essentially the first steps of the process. Excellent, good. Um, another question we have is, uh, when considering a non-technically upgraded shop, so one that does ha has no IoT or AI integration at all, where would you recommend starting to get the most bang for the buck? Okay, well, the good news is that if you're asking this question, you're, you're not alone, okay? Most manufacturing shops are, as you said, Heather, uh, non-technically upgraded, okay? We, we see some tremendously digitized uh, production sites, in segments such as automotive OEMs or, or uh, semiconductor or, or some food and beverage um, um, manufacturing sites. But for the most part, uh, you know, most factories from the OEM level down to suppliers aren't super connected today. So that's a common challenge uh, that we see. And if you're facing that challenge, rest assured you're not alone. But, you know, when we talk about bang for the buck, uh, the first question is where can we make an impact? And that goes back to the question of, of what are we trying to do? So find a problem that is meaningful. Find a problem that fixing would make a difference. Uh, that's a good way to get management uh, interest or, or buy-in or budget, but frankly also from the operator level. Um, and having said that, you want to keep it, you want to keep it simple. Uh, you want to start very gradually and let me share here a quick um, view of an approach that is very, um, you know, kind of stepwise. And when we say keep it simple, keep it contained uh, to one production line, uh, consider the value. And, and really it's not just trying out the technology, it's also about demonstrating the value. You define a pilot, you define the KPIs, they're meaningful, the pilot reaches these KPIs, and then you start talking about scaling up to production, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to have those first quick wins. Uh, they go a long way, and the big bang for the buck will come later. But if you run too fast, you will never get there. Okay. Um, so if you're then looking at your payback period, like how long – would you expect um, to look at that when you're implementing a new system like this? Um, yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Truth is, it's actually very fast. It's, um, again, our experience is, is uh, seeing this well under a year, um, sometimes as little as six months or less. Um, and I think it comes from, from two, you know, the two sides of this equation. First of all, the impact is dramatic. So once you put this into play, the uh, return, the benefit is substantial, and it's actually in many cases uh, measurable. Um, on the other hand, the investment, and I think here is important to add the, the cost of these technologies 
you know, sensor technologies, um, robotics, um, in many cases software are, are consumed as software as a service, reduce the level of investment today as it compared to what it was several years ago. Um, hence the investment is, you know, matches very well the, the substantial return and for a fast ROI. You know, we've been doing this for a while. Um, we've seen, for example, the cost of, of networking a factory uh, coming down from hundreds of thousands of dollars to, you know, to five-digit amounts, sometimes very low five-digit amounts. So even regardless of our own, you know, software business, simply introducing networking and sensors to a factory has come down by an order of magnitude just in the past few years. So um, if, if companies are saying they're not ready to adapt, um, to move towards IoT and smart automation, like what are the best ways or the best suggestions for people to go back to their companies and say, you know, this is how or why we can do this? Well, first I would ask, you know, do you have a choice, right? What happens if you don't do this? And, and, and you know, here, obviously coming from a technologist perspective, I, I would argue that, you know, not doing it is also a decision and it's not always the right decision. So now the question is how? And, and again, I would argue that, you know, while this is the latest wave of technology, this is consistent with other uh, technologies and how you would go about adopting them. Go back 20 years to the adoption of CAD or, or, or 10 years to the adoption of, of robotics. Uh, it's the same steps. Um, you are, you know, first or second or, or last to adopt. Uh, you need to demonstrate the business value. You need to, um, to deploy and, and get the, uh, you know, the employee and management support and buy-in. So in this respect, it's all the same. Um, if, if specifically you ask, you know, um, how to do it or who to talk to, that's probably, you know, different in every organization, uh, the DNA, the management structure, and so forth. So looking at the business case, um, it, 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 it seems like that's like the most challenging aspect, trying to convince management um, about the potential of starting. And I know we said, you know, if you, uh, you know, not doing it is also a choice. Um, but some companies are doing pilots on projects and um, in one, on, on a specific uh, a dual pilot project on one value stream and trying out digital solutions. Do you have any recommendations along those lines as far as, um, I know we talked just a little bit about like picking one thing and kind of starting small, but are there any aspects of, a, um, that, uh, of manufacturing or a, a business that you would recommend to kind of start at specifically? Or are there certain sure. things so, that sh wouldn't make, don't make sense to start with? No, I understand. So first of all, uh, uh, we're advocates of, of the pilot approach. I think software technology today lends to that. Uh, you know, you don't need to invest hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in, in capital equipment. So yes, do a pilot and, and, and get a good feel for it. Um, you know, see how it works, see what it means to you. Uh, and, and learn the best practices. Um, if we're talking about impact, um, our experience is that, you know, it's, it's often easy or easier to mention the bottom line savings, but it's that top line impact that really makes a difference. So if you're trying to get the attention of your CEO uh, or, or general manager, and you tell them, okay, I can save 5% material, he says, well, that's very interesting, um, and, you know, whatever. But if you go to him and you say, I can increase our throughput by 5%, our experience is that you'll get a lot more attention. So uh, try to identify those areas where, you know, there's a specific need, certainly. But our experience that this technology is able to hit both pain points, both levels of, of benefit, 
and that the top line impact is typically getting far more interest from, from the higher ups. Um, okay, so one of the questions we have is how do I get everyone to stop firefighting and start fixing the problem? It sounds like everybody um, might be having that uh, issue, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that's a pretty common question. Yeah, so, you know, uh, not, not necessarily from the technology point of view, more from, from a management point of view. You know, it's, um, people often do that from, from good intentions, um, and, you know, they have their challenges, they have their roles and, and personal KPIs. But, um, but, yeah, you know, if you do firefighting all day, you, you, never, you know, le never look up to solve the bigger problem. It's a huge challenge, huge, because, you know, considering the limitations or the challenges we discussed before, uh, that, an, uh, that an is all about firefighting. And it reminds me of this cartoon where, you know, um, it's like, uh, you know, the, the Flintstones and you're offering them a round wheel, and they said that they're too busy because they're trying to push a squared wheel cart. So it's... Um, yeah, somebody needs to look two steps ahead and take you know take the head out of the ditches. Otherwise, the organization will will just drown in, in this firefighting mode. Um, in, in many cases, actually, we see the appointment of, of such executives. Uh, they have different names: uh, digitization officer, or, or chief digital officer, or or sometimes it's the new transformation of was before a, a continuous improvement officer or, or you know, director, or whatever. Um, and, and these role is critical. So we see companies appointing such a role. Uh, they have the ability and they are measured by introducing this technology and they are, you know, they get a pass, they get a leave from dealing with the day-to-day -day trouble and are able to take the organization forward. And so if, if you have someone in that role, obviously that makes things much easier. Um, if you don't have someone in that role, what would be your, um, you know, what would your recommendations be? If you're, if you're not in a position to have, or you're not an organization that has that or in a position to create that role. Well, it doesn't have to be a full-time job, but somebody has to do it. And if you don't appoint someone to do it, then in many cases, you know, the, the routine will take over and it just won't happen. Um, you know, I know we have a lot of folks on manufacturing today. Consider yourself 20 years ago or 30 at the crossroads of adopting CAD. Uh, you know, you were busy and doing, you know, pen and pencil and paper designs. And, you know, and imagine yourself today still doing that. So somewhere in the last 30 years, uh, your organization adopted uh, computerized design. Um, and those that did it sooner um, probably do a better job at it uh, today. Um, another of our questions is, um, from all the different suppliers of uh, cognitive automation or manufacturing execution systems, um, one, is there one overall must-have way of doing things or a methodology that sets one or more companies apart from the rest? Um, okay, um, it's a great question. I don't think there's one way, but I think it's a question of which way fits your organization. Um, you know, the MES market, the MES category, has been around for years. It's, it's a very fragmented category. That is, there are many providers. Some of them are industry specific. Um, you know, I have MES for healthcare manufacturing. I have an MES for, I don't know, oil refineries, etc. But whatever the industry vertical is, I would check to what extent they are ready to deal with this picture we're now seeing on screen. Um, you know, is the, um, is the architecture modern? To what extent they have adopted or are able to do IoT, machine connectivity, and apply artificial intelligence? 
There is a reason that why these technologies are, are adopted at a growing rate, simply because they work and, and are incredibly effective. So I would evaluate their, uh, their ability to deal with the scale of data, which typically implies also being on the cloud. Uh, certainly their ability to be, um, to protect your data, which is critical today. Uh, as we elevate this, by the way, what does it mean if you have multiple sites or if you want to integrate your supply chain into all of this? So the latest software architecture also allows for that. So you need to consider this, again, from a business problem, what are you trying to achieve? And then you need to ensure that this provider um, fits by technology and also by you know, the, the data structures that they have and their ability to integrate that they fit what you need and some, I mean, some will do a better job at it. And this is the vendor that you need to pick, the vendor that's right for you. Um, we had a question come in about, um, well, I guess it says, is are industrial gateways really required when we talk about IIoT? I'm sorry, Heather, could you repeat it, please? Sure. Um, are industrial gateways really required when we talk about IIoT? Okay, so I guess the uh, uh, gateways as in networking equipment. Um, in, in a way, yes. So the, uh, I guess if I understand the question correctly and, and for, the, um, for the rest of the audience, um, we're collecting data. We're collecting a lot of data, IoT, and this data needs to then, then be uh, you know, distributed to, to servers and then um, managed and so forth. So there's a basic element here of, of networking and the networking needs to be robust. There's a lot of data going on. Um, so, you know, yes, we need to have a connected network factory. Um, there is one step before that actually, uh, what's often called today edge computing. Uh, and, and allow me to ex explain that concept. So if we're typically in the world of industrial IoT talking about cloud computing, uh, edge computing refers to that software layer that is um, on premise at your production facility, on the edge, so to speak. Now, this layer is actually critical because it serves as an intermediary layer to initially process the data and not everything needs to be sent on to the cloud or to the servers if they're within your organization. The sensors and machines create so much data that a lot of it is routine, for example, and need not be stored. And perhaps you only want to store the changes or, or exceptions. Uh, this edge computing may also have different logic elements uh, that allow for a quicker on-the-spot computing. But the point or the typical architecture that you will see is that there is an element close to the machines, to the sensors, to the users, that is the edge. Data is then networked to a central server, whether it's on the cloud or in some internal data center. Uh, the intelligence, the AI, uh, the algorithms are run at that um, server area, and the outcomes are then sent back. So in the midst of all this, uh, closing the loop back to the questions, then yes, there are, there are um, internet gateways and so forth. And, and I do hope I, I understood the question correctly. Thank you for that. Um, and so we keep talking about the volume of data and um, you know, we were talking about the systems that are going to be interconnected to process that data. But how much does the quality of the data and the actual process of acquiring the data how critical is that to implement a digital transformation? Um, well, first of all, it, it's a great question, and the answer is yes, it's very important. You know, the old cliche is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so the data needs to be of good quality. Now, that, that's an inherent challenge, especially in manufacturing, but how do you deal with that challenge? I think that's, that's the better question. Um, and the first means to deal with the challenge is to be razor sharp about the data that you need. If you cast a wide net, and I mentioned this earlier, 
you know, oh, let's get all the data, uh, then almost by definition, you're, you know, you're increasing the risk of, of, of bad data or data that you need to cleanse. So yes, be very focused on the data that you need to solve that specific problem with which we started this discussion. But true, even that data needs to be cleansed or, or, or uh, controlled. Um, there I mentioned those edge computing elements and so forth. And now that you have good quality data uh, streaming in, etc., then also um, what do you do about it? You know, how do you uh, leverage that data in real time? How do you um, understand, quote unquote, as software? How does the software understand what's going on? And then driving the resulting alerts or, uh, or optimization, you know, uh, recommendation. So to ensure that full cycle, you need a, a good source of data. And perhaps the last comment is that the best sort of the source of data is digital is a sensor or, or, or a machine controller as opposed to our input as, as users where, you know, um, we often may or do make mistakes. So, you know, combining digitization with, with a sharp or, or focused approach really helps address this problem. Um, one of our questions is, what companies are evolving as front, uh, front runners for data analytics and visualization in the industrial or manufacturing sector? Okay. Um, I hope it's okay. I, I don't want to mention specific firms, or, or perhaps um, I can take it offline. Um, you know, I can <laughs> I can recommend our company, but that you know that's besides the point. Um, what I what I would look for is in the question there are you know visualization and analytics, and actually these are two different things. Um, many times we go to a company and they say that um, you know we we have a dashboard, uh, we have visualization tools, or we want to get visualization tools. And if you think about it, the visualization is quite limited. Um, for those of you that can see my screen now, this is actually a dashboard from a navigation app. If you're using uh, Google Maps or, or Waze, you can actually go to waze.com and type in any city. Uh, most of us on the call I know are from Canada or the States. But this is actually a picture of Paris. And this is a live dashboard of all the traffic jams and alerts, etc. So this is visualization. This is good but this is limited uh, because if you need to drive from point A to point B, you need to be staring at this dashboard all day. You need to understand what you're looking at and eventually you need to be solving the problem. So this is visualization. Uh, we see an abundance of dashboards and what's called business intelligence or business analytic tools. They allow you to drill down and, 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 and drill through and, and change the dashboard in so many ways. But at the end of the day, you are doing that. You, the industrial engineer, you, the executive, you, the supervisor. So it's a very useful tool, but at the end of all this, the problem resolution lies with the user, with the human. So this is human intelligence. This is not artificial intelligence. If you think about it, what these navigation apps do very well, they don't show you a map. If you run it on your phone, they actually give you instructions. Uh, they skip the visualization stage. They basically tell you what to do. They tell you about problems that are about to happen. And in many cases, they also accommodate for the problems. They'll change your route. So when we talk about AI, this is the level of experience on the production floor that we're aiming for. Um, as you're considering different vendors, see how far they've went beyond visualization, which is important, but it only gives you part of the solution, and see how far they went beyond that into actual actionable alerts and certainly actionable recommendations. So as to say, Mr. Supervisor, you have a bottleneck or you're about to have a bottleneck, but then maybe even better, 
What do you do about that bottleneck and how do you address it? I think that's helpful. That's really, I think, uh, a key um, aspect of what we're talking about is that it's not just can you visualize, you know, what your options are, but you you have a, a system that's going to guide you through to making the right choices for the outcome that you're looking for. Um, another question that we have is, do you have a specific example of how AI was used or is being used to improve on-time delivery or lead time reduction uh, and associated throughput in a manufacturing company? Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me kind of give a bit more context here and, and then answer the question directly. Um, one of our customers uh, um, make parts and they use a lot of time sensitive material. Now, um, it's actually very, very hard to manage the process because you need to allocate the right material to the right job. Um, you need to ensure it has sufficient shelf life uh, to hold that entire production process and, and not expire midway. Uh, specific examples could be the use of, of different resins or chemicals. In this example, we're actually talking about a company that makes parts from uh, composite materials, carbon fiber. We see that a lot in aerospace, automotive, but you can find similar use cases in other industries. So first of all, you need to know what's going on with these materials in terms of their remaining shelf life, their temperature or humidity conditions, and that data would come from sensors. So that the, um, the environmental conditions are, are tracked by sensors. Now we know the uh, condition of the materials and we have a good handle on their remaining shelf life. Um, that's IoT, that's data. But that's not enough, we need, we need more. We need the production schedule. We need to know what we need to make today, that comes from the ERP. And we need to know how to make it. That often comes from the uh, engineering systems, CAD, or, or PLM. So now we know from systems uh, what needs to be done today. We know how to make it from PLM, for example. And our sensors are telling us a lot of very important about the materials. And now a few things start to happen. First of all, as the production process uh, ensues, and progresses shift to shift, day to day, we collect a lot of information on past history and the current situation. Then AI, and now I'm tying back to your question, the artificial intelligence starts to learn different patterns. Starts to see that under specific circumstances, you know, standard time was 40 hours for the process, but under specific or different circumstances, it's going to take longer. What you thought will take 40 hours, today will take 60 hours. Why? It's a combination of, of overload, machine breakdown, or maybe some inexperienced employee. So now we are predicting that a given part will not take 40 hours to produce, will take 60 hours to produce. This is AI. Uh, specifically, uh, the algorithm is from the machine learning category. Um, now, you have a material in stock. This material has 50 hours to live. If all was normal, this material was sufficient for this job. The material has 50 hours, the job needs 40, we're good. Um, but now we're predicting or experiencing a delay. So using this material for that job, would be, um, would be hazardous, may or will expire in the midst of the operation, and eventually you won't only scrap the material, you will actually scrap the entire part. Um, the, the, the impact, of course, is you know, loss of, of material, which goes to the bottom line, but the question was about throughput. And in this case, without this prediction, this company would have made this part in its entirety, only to scrap it uh, at the end and go through a rework process. So by 
controlling for this information and predicting the failure, we cut this problem and uh, early on, prevent the rework. Also, while this is running, we're also reducing risk. So we see a lot less lab testing, which then again improves productivity and throughput. So simply by connecting to the production floor and then applying the AI, or rather not so simply, but by doing that, uh, we're able to predict such quality issues and increase the throughput. Um, we have a question about, um, do you have an example of AI implemented in health and safety procedures that are required in industrial applications or dangerous uh, machinery with robotics, et cetera? Okay. Um, that's an excellent question. We do, and this question goes straight to the question of, uh, you know, software autonomy. Um, let me bring up here another slide real quick. So these machines create a lot of data. And in many cases, the, you know, the question of, of safety is, is extremely fundamental. So if I understood the question correctly, at what point do you allow the software AI to shut down a machine, as an example, if it is, uh, you know, expecting, predicting a safety issue. You know, this machine is going to, uh, to break down, causing one of the levers to, to pop and, 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 you know, God forbid, injure someone. So we are seeing that. We are seeing more and more examples of this software autonomy. Uh, consider, by the way, not only manufacturing, but uh, power you know, stations, nuclear reactors, etc. But when you uh, apply or or delegate uh, autonomy to the software, typically we see two questions. You know, first of all, time. Um, do we have time for the um, for the supervisor or, or, or operator uh, to intervene? What are the implications of delaying a decision? If it's a safety issue, typically there is no time. Hence, we would give the software autonomy to shut the machine down. On the flip side, what are the costs of making a decision one way or the other? So here, typically, we're in the realm of, of quality, let's say, not necessarily safety. This machine is about to create bad parts. Do we shut it down? Well, it may improve quality, but reduce our throughput. So that goes back to supervisory, and do we have time to involve the, um, you know, uh, the staff? Uh, this also varies by industries. Um, in, in semiconductor, you will see a high rate of autonomy. Um, generally, in process uh, manufacturing, you see a higher level of autonomy. In discrete manufacturing, typically there is time for intervention unless there is a safety issue. Um, okay, uh, we have a question here that says, uh, considering you've done a pilot for one factory, how do you avoid training your ML model again and again while scaling to other 100 similar, not same factories? Okay, um, so the question, again, for, for the, to explain it perhaps to, to everyone else, training the model, the reference is to the, um, is to the AI, to the, uh, let's say, machine learning or, or any other AI model that we've deployed. Um, you need to retrain a model if you're putting it in a completely different environment, uh, or more specifically, or if you're solving a completely different problem. If I mentioned earlier on, for example, our capabilities around uh, tooling optimization, then our ability as a software vendor to generalize the problem to an extent that um, it's actually quite similar, whether you're doing molding or casting or, or, or any other form, I don't know, injection molding and the like, then we are able to create a general model, which is actually pre-configured to run and make wise predictions from day one. And then as we collect more data, this model becomes 
not only more intelligent, but actually more specific to that manufacturing environment. Hence, the recommendations it will produce will get better and better. So now you've deployed it at site number one. You move it to site number two. If the sites are similar, then the model will, uh, you know, would relearn or close the gap very quickly. If the sites are vastly different to an extreme that we take the model as if it was a completely different company, then that's okay too, because it's kind of built on, on industry-wide best practices. And again, being very specific, this model deals with tooling optimization and that model deals with work and process inventory. Uh, so the specificity of the application uh, creates a very solid foundation uh, for a quick deployment and, and a quick time to value. Okay, um, we're kind of within our last 10 minutes here, so we'll try to get a couple more questions answered. Um, Emner, what role do you see with IIoT and submetering, both at the facility or utility level and the plant and production um, or manufacturing level? Uh, it's a good question. Here, here I'll be a bit more cautious, um, not being a big expert on, on that topic. Um, from what we've seen, first of all, it's a question of, of, of correctly structuring um, the data collection and distribution from the different, um, you know, areas we are sub-metering. Um, I think the challenge here is to, um, is to um, manage the data and collect it. And typically what makes it easier to do is to collect one form of data and then uh, add more layers of data but establish that network structure early on. Um, we haven't seen it as much within a single production site, but we have seen similar challenges across an enterprise where each factory operates independently, but you also want to centralize data. So the key here is, is an element of standardization uh, that some companies do better than other. But if you're looking into that direction, then it's a must. You cannot afford big differences between your different units. So again, to the extent that we've seen this issue, these are the key points that I could uh, comment about. Okay. Um, I think this is uh, going to be our last question. Um, it, could AI algorithms be used to complement physics-based models for finding the optimal processing parameters to optimize multiple objective functions, for example, surface roughness, density, et cetera? Um, yes, I think so. Um, allow me to share something here real quick. Um, so the question is actually more on the design side uh, and less so on the, um, on the manufacturing side. But what AI does really well is, um, is balance multiple objectives. So if it's a very complicated problem and you need to balance uh, different goals that often could be competing, you know, um, strength versus weight, throughput versus quality. So yes, um, AI um, will do a, a better job or will give an extraordinary tool in the hands of the, of the manager or, or engineer. Um, the example here, by the way, is from Autodesk. This is a kind of a cool new um, field of, of generative design. And here the engineer is, you know, setting up the problem uh, for constraints, materials, et cetera, roughness and, and everything about that. But then the software goes on and explores and generates just numerous design alternatives, which can look kind of crazy, but meet the, um, the requirements and balancing these multiple objectives. Uh, the process is interactive. The user sees a, a direction that he or she likes and picks it, and the software then repeatedly produces more options very quickly until they reach together a, a design that they like they being the, the engineer and the software. So the engineer sets the, uh, you know, the, um, the boundaries and the requirements, and the software indeed does create 
alternatives that balance the various objectives. This is an example from, um, from CAD. Many people say this is the future of CAD, but the same would apply in, in manufacturing. You know, you can increase your throughput, but heighten your quality risk. Uh, you can reduce, um, sorry, increase your material yields, but increase your whip. So the reality of manufacturing is never easy, and it's often about balancing these objectives. Great, thank you for that. Um, I think we are at about our time here. So I, um, I think we're gonna wrap things up. Um, Abner, I wanna thank you again for helping us answer these questions. I think we got through uh, quite a number of them. Um, I know some people may have additional uh, questions for you. Um, what's the best way to um, for people to get in touch with you if they have more questions? So first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to, to take more questions. Uh, if you allow me to share my screen for one more minute, I can share sure, my go email, ahead. and that's probably the best way to to do that. Okay. So Heather, can you see my email now? I sure can. Okay, great. So again, uh, everyone on the phone, on the call, uh, thanks for participating, and I, I really appreciate the questions. Um, really glad to do this, and, and it's a great discussion. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, anything I can help with, really feel free to do that. Uh, here's my email on screen. Uh, it may take me a day to respond. I'm often on the road, but um, please feel free to do that. It's, it's a pleasure, um, and I'm always happy to support SME. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Avner. And for those of you who are uh, maybe just listening, um, the email address for Avner is Avner, A-V-N-E-R dot B-E-N-B-A-S-S-A-T at Platane, which is P-L-A-T-A-I-N-E dot com. Um, on behalf of SME and CMTS, I want to thank everybody who's attended today. Uh, these sessions are really designed for you, and we hope you've gained some insights that you can take back to your organization. Don't forget to complete our survey, give us your feedback so we can keep making these even better. And until next time, I'm Heather Bros, and this has been Ask Me Anything Manufacturing. Have a great afternoon.